Amen. Well, good morning, church, and Merry Christmas to you. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, hope everybody's in the Christmas spirit. I haven't seen any Grinches this morning. Everybody's been, I've only seen like two Scrooges, so that's, just kidding. Everybody's been super uh, in, uh, joyful and excited this morning, so I can tell that Christmas is here. We're excited, and we have that joy in our hearts. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 1. Hey, as you just watched in the video, um, that was Randy and Joan Bell, who our church has uh, partnered with in the past and, and continuously, and they are missionaries in Slovenia. And so the offering that we have been collecting all month this month is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, and every single penny that goes into that uh, goes to people just like Randy and Joan, who are in a different part of the world. And I love what she said, we're all missionaries, right? They're just Christians living in a different place, uh, living out their lives for Christ, sharing the gospel with others very intentionally. And so that's what we all want to do, but we want to support those who have been called to do that overseas and in other parts of the world. So uh, I encourage you to give this Sunday and <clears throat> next Sunday will be the last chances you have. So next Sunday is the final Sunday in December, and uh, that'll be the last chance to contribute to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So thank you so much for giving to that. Well, before we dig into Matthew chapter uh, 1, verse 18, I want us to pray, and then we'll get, get right into it. Jesus, thank you so much for this season where we get to remember who you are, that you came to earth to live and die for us. God, that you rose from the grave, you have power over sin and death, Lord, and our faith in you credits your righteousness to us, Jesus. So we thank you for living that life we should have lived, for dying the death we should have died, and for raising over the power of sin and death, Lord, to give us that same resurrection power in our lives today. Lord, we believe your word is holy and true, and I pray now that your Holy Spirit would speak it deep into our hearts and help us to understand it so that we leave here tra uh, changed and transformed by your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, according to the uh, classic Christmas song, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, right? But I think from a social perspective, it's also a very uh, interesting time of the year. And I don't I don't just mean socially interesting because of the uh, crazy family members that we all have, right, okay, um, though there's plenty of that, right, uh, except, you know, the older I get, the more I'm starting to think and the more kids I have, like, maybe I'm the crazy family member, like, how do you, how do you know that, right? Um, anyways, what I mean is Christmas is interesting socially because it kind of forces lots of people to at least think about who Jesus Christ is, right? So this, this season, in other words, especially here in America, it's, it's almost unavoidable to not see a nativity scene in a public place or somewhere in a store or a restaurant, uh, even around town in restaurants and, and shopping places, you hear Christmas music being played. And whether the people playing it realize it or not, a lot of that Christmas music is singing about the coming of the Savior, right? And the Messiah, and Jesus being king over all. And you hear that in stores, shopping, and, and we're hearing these words and these things about Jesus. So the Christmas story is really all around us. It's, it's about Jesus coming to earth and to save people from their sins. And so we hear it all around us. It's really unavoidable this time of year. But here's the thing, I, I think that when you hear and you truly receive and you understand that Christmas story, it should compel us to worship God, right? So with gratitude in our hearts for what he has done for coming to earth as a human in the form of us to live and die for us, it should compel us to worship. So all around the world, over the next few days, something socially very interesting is happening. Millions of people over the next couple of days will be worshiping God, or at least it will appear that they will be worshiping God. And so what I mean is you're going to find lots of people in buildings similar to this, doing a service similar to this, 
Lots of people sitting in pews and in chairs around the world over these next couple of days as so-called worshipers of this Christ who has come to earth. So today we're going to look at the birth of Christ and some of the events that followed. And this historical account that Matthew gives us is going to show us three types of worshipers. Three types of people who have been compelled for some reason, right or wrong, good or bad, to bring their worship to Jesus. So when I say worshiper, I want to be clear, I mean somebody who is sitting in a church around Christmas time or any other time of year for that matter, that includes all of us in here, right? Three types of worshipers we're going to see in the Christmas story. So let's start at chapter 1, verse 18. And what I want us to do is just kind of read through Matthew's account of how this happened, and I'm going to stop a little bit along the way and explain some things, and then we'll, make, we'll look at the three types of worshipers at the end of the story. So chapter 1, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, you have this young woman named Mary, okay? And you have this young man named Joseph. Both are Jewish. And they are engaged or betrothed, as the ESV calls it. They're betrothed to be married. Now, in those days, betrothal or engagement meant that they were under a legal binding contract. Betrothal and engagement was more serious then than it was now, than it is now. They're under a legal binding contract that said that they were going to get married, all right? So the only thing left to do was to have the wedding, consummate the marriage physically, and then start living together, right? So here's what happens, though. Joseph finds out something that is a little surprising. His fiance, who he has never been with physically, is pregnant. All right? So Joseph assumes what any of us would assume, right? Mary has been unfaithful. She has committed adultery, it seems. She has broken this legal contract that they have already agreed to, even though they haven't been with each other physically. So Joseph decided to righteously divorce her, but in a way that was quiet and not public. He didn't want this to be known because he wanted to protect Mary's reputation as much as possible. All right, and there's a lot more I could say about that, but that's the gist of the story. Let's keep reading in verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So, Joseph, you can imagine just the the fear and the anxiety and the worry. I mean, he had been legally bound to this woman that he loved and he wanted to marry and build a family with, and then all of a sudden he thinks that she's been unfaithful. And so the whole process is ruined, and so an angel then appears to Joseph and tells him, don't worry, Joseph. It is not what it, what it appears. It's not what you think. Mary has not committed adultery. She hasn't been unfaithful. She's never known any man. This pregnancy is supernatural. It's supernatural by God, the Holy Spirit. She has been chosen as the person who will bring the Son of God into the world as a human. 
So this is very important because not only, of course, does it show the divinity of Jesus, that he is not a man only, he is fully God and fully man. He's both, right? Jesus is fully God. He's fully divine. He possesses all the characteristics of God. He is God, but he comes in the form of a man so that he can identify with us, so that he can live as our substitute and die as our substitute right? What a beautiful thing that God would do to become one of us, to live and die the life and death that we could not live and should have died, right? So, like we talked about last week, all the genealogy in the whole Old Testament is pointing to this moment where the God of heaven, the God of all creation, will come to earth as one of us, as the Messiah, the anointed one of Israel that everyone's been waiting for, He's here. This is the anointed one who will accomplish God's redemptive plan to save humanity. The angel is assuring Joseph, that's what's happening here, son of David. This is the one. He will be the son of David who will sit on the throne forever. Let's keep reading chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So these first two verses here uh, give us some details that really set up the rest of this story. And so I want to take just a moment to describe some characters here. So first of all, it tells us that Herod was king at the time in Judea. All right, so who's Herod? Well, Herod, let's just say uh, you would not want to get on his bad side, okay? He was not a friendly guy. He was the king of the Jews. Uh, William Barclay explains what we know from history about Herod, and I want want to read this to you. He says, in his old age, he was known as a murderous old man. If he suspected anyone as a rival to his power, that person was promptly eliminated. He murdered his wife, Miriam, and her mother, Alexandra, his oldest son, Antipater, and two other sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, were all assassinated by him. The Roman emperor Augustus said that it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Talking about a Scrooge, right? King Herod was the most evil and wicked kind of king. He would kill his own, he did, he killed his own family members, history tells us, legend tells us, that uh, he, he killed his own family members, right, because they were threatening his own power. So what was his number one idol in life? His power, him, right, him being in control and in charge. And so that's King Herod, okay? Now the next characters that are introduced to us are, guess who? Those famous wise men, right? So, now the Greek word that we get from the term, uh, for, for the term wise men uh, is magi, which in English sometimes is tra- translated uh, as magi, and that's, that is where we get the word magic, right? Um, now these weren't just like magicians though. Uh, that word refers to someone in ancient Persia, okay, and Babylon, the great city of Babylon, was the capital of Persia. So that's why they came from the east, right? This is east of Israel. And it refers to someone who was skilled in philosophy, uh, medicine, natural science, right? These are astrologers, philosophers, scientists. These are very, very truly wise men, right? Or at least they're very book smart. So apparently they had studied, though, even some of these Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah in Israel. Now you have to keep in mind, these guys are from Babylon, where the Israelites, the Jews, were exiled for many years, right? So there's some Jewish culture and Jewish teachings probably lingering in Persia, where these men are coming from. So they've probably read the Old Testament, uh, or at least in partiality. They've probably read parts of it. Um, And so they know that there's this prophecy most likely coming uh, from the West in Jerusalem and Israel. But notice that it also tells us in these two verses in chapter 2 that this happens after Jesus was born. Now, 
we're about to see in verse 11, it tells us that the wise men uh, walked into Mary and Joseph's house in Bethlehem, Bethlehem to see Jesus. Now, we don't know exactly when this happened, but we do know that Jesus was under two years old. Now, again, we'll see this detail later in the story. But Mary and Joseph are living uh, in a house by the time the wise men get there. Now, listen, I don't want to ruin your nativity scene at home, okay? <laughs> but please do not put the wise men right there in the stable where baby Jesus is. They weren't there, okay? Right? The wise men were not at the manger scene. I don't know where we get that from, but they were not there. You need to take your wise men and you need to put them in the kitchen or in the living room, right? They're on the way, okay? They're on the way to get there. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry if I just ruined that for you. Um, let's keep reading. Verse 3. So when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Wait, what? There's a new king? I'm sorry, what? I'm the king of the Jews, right? I mean, I'm, I'm willing to kill my own family members to keep this job, and you're telling me that a new one's been born? So Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and guess what? It says, all Jerusalem with him. Like, everybody's on the edge of their seat because they know the temper that this King Herod has, right? They know how devastating this could be if he really goes crazy thinking that a new king has been born somewhere. So the whole town is on edge, verse 4, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, right? He wants to know how old the baby is now. See, this is an important little piece of information because this gives Herod a clue as to about how old this child is. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So the wise men travel about 900 miles from Persia to worship. Herod says, oh yeah, let me know. I want to worship him too. Like, yeah, right. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and what? Worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So the wise men finally make it. This supernatural occurrence uh, in the sky is leading them to this place, this house, right? And so they get there and they find this Jesus, this young baby, toddler-aged Jesus, all right? Probably, we know, under two years old. And just for the record, Again, I, I really don't mean to ruin Christmas for you, but uh, you know we really don't know there were three wise men, right? Like we've just assumed that because there's uh, three gifts, but there could have been more than three, right? And we at least know there's more than one because it's plural, but we don't know how many there were. Okay, again, I'm sorry if I'm ruining your nativity set. Uh, verse 13, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Right, so this angel appears to Joseph and says, you've got to leave. This is about to get bad. Verse 14, and he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, who else, who else had been in Egypt for a period of time before Christ? His ancestors were in Egypt, in slavery. Out of Egypt, the prophet said, I called my son. Verse 16, then Herod 
when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. See, that's why Herod was asking when they had originally seen this star in the sky. So he calculated the time and decided that any child in Bethlehem, any, any male child, any little boy, two years old and under, needed to die so that he could still keep his throne. Very tragic historic event that happened there. Verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 19, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. You have this amazing story happening, in many ways a tragic story, a terrible situation, where the pride and the power of this evil, wicked ruler is doing unspeakable, unfathomable things to innocent life. But yet, here he is pretending that he wants to worship God. And then you have the wise men seeking for some kind of truth. They study the stars, they study medicine, they study science, and they just want to know what's really true in this world. And then you have Mary and Joseph who I, can, I can't imagine the pressure and the feeling and the anxiety and the fear that's in their hearts taking their young little baby, fleeing to a foreign country, running for their lives, literally. You see, Matthew is showing us three types of so-called worshipers. So I want to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about those three <clears throat> worshipers. Number one, the wise men. Who are they? They're seekers. They're seekers looking for truth. Now, like I already said, they apparently had some knowledge of scripture. They must have known <clears throat> about the prophecies that a king of the Jews would be born. They did have a sincere desire to know truth. They were men devoted their you know, they devoted their whole lives to discovering truth, really, in the realms of science, in the realms of philosophy and astrology, right? I mean, these men prized knowing what is reality around them, what is real and what is true. That meant the world to them, so much that they were willing to travel 900 miles following a star in the sky, some kind of most likely supernatural phenomenon by God, right? Following that all the way to this little tiny place, this little house where this humble, small, little baby child is with his mom and dad. The wise men respected Jesus. They gave him gifts. They just want to know what's real. They just want to know truth. I think in today's world, we have a lot of people in the same boat. There's people all around us who are just seeking to know what is right and what is true. And I mean, honestly, aren't we all? I mean, to some degree, we all want to know exactly what is right and what is true. And everybody in here and everybody in this world can, can say they are living their lives right now according to what they think is true. Even if you don't like your life, 
Even if you're upset with your circumstances, even if you are displeased and angry or depressed or fearful, you're still in your mind, you are living your life and choosing things and acting certain ways based on what you believe in your heart to be true about yourself and true about this world and true about God. Our world is filled with searching and seekers of truth. I think especially here in the South, a lot of people are searching for truth and they already have some kind of general knowledge about Christianity, right? I mean, who was not raised, you know, in the Bible Belt and has not heard, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? We hear these things. We hear about Christianity. We walk through the town center and the Avenues Mall and all these places and we see nativity scenes and we hear Christmas songs. We are saturated with these thoughts of truth. Just like the wise men, there are people all around us searching. But I want to ask you specifically this morning... And I know a lot of us in here are believers and and we're here because we, we have found the truth, but maybe you're here this morning because you are seeking truth. And I'm glad. I'm so thankful that you're here and you're seeking this truth. But I want to ask everybody in here this morning, have you really found truth? And I'm not just asking you, have you found what seems to be true for you? Because that's philosophically, that doesn't make sense. What's true for you may not be true for someone else, and so therefore it's not absolute truth. Jesus said he is the way, the life, and the truth. He's the truth that you've been looking for in a world that is hungry for meaning and purpose. Look, I want to know my meaning in life, don't you? I want to know why I was created. I want to know what my purpose is. In this world, we're all looking for meaning and purpose, and Jesus came to earth He came to earth to, guess what, reveal to us what actually is true. He came to earth to reveal to us who God actually is, to make him known in a very special way so that we can have a relationship with our creator, the keeper and maker of all things true, so we can know our own hearts, so we can know what is right and wrong, so we can know what sin is and the devastating consequences it has on our lives psychologically, socially, emotionally, and relationally. Jesus brings truth to us. He is truth. And if you turn to him, if you turn to him, as your Savior and substitute before God, He will show you the truth about forgiveness, the truth about grace, and He will show you the truth and the purpose and the meaning of your life to glorify Him, to live for Him. Jesus is the fulfillment of all truth. If you're seeking for that today, I encourage you to turn to Him, turn to His Word, the ultimate truth. The second type of worshiper we see here this morning in this story is Herod, who I would call a pretender. Pretenders. Now, like I've already told you, Herod's actions and character proved he was not someone who followed God, right? He did not know God. He, it was very clear he thought he was basically a God. Uh, he was as prideful as you could get. He attempted to kill Jesus, as we know. He did kill his own family. But in verse 8, Herod tells the wise men that he wants to worship Jesus. But was that sincere? Well, obviously not, right? What is he doing? He's pretending, right? Now, now why, would, why was he pretending to want to worship Jesus? Why would someone do that? Well, of course, we know because Herod's number one concern is his own agenda, So he would pretend, in this moment then, he would pretend to be whoever he needed to be. He would pretend to be and do whatever he needed to do to accomplish his purpose and his agenda, right? Even if it meant pretending to be a worshiper of this new baby king. Now, we may look at someone as evil and as wicked as Herod, and we'll say, well, I'm, that's not me. 
right? I mean, I'm not planning on, you know, doing this kind of mass execution. This is crazy, right? I'm not that person. I'm not evil and wicked like Herod. I'm obviously a better person than him. But I want to ask you this morning, like, are we really sometimes? I think one of the greatest tragedies in our day and in our time and age here in the American church is that there are lots of people who are in churches all across America who are pretending. For whatever reason, they're just pretending to worship. They're pretending to be a true follower of Jesus. And you know why? It's to get something else. There are people in our churches who are pretending to love God, but really it's not God they want. It is something else to satisfy their agenda. Maybe it's to get approval of others. Maybe they're in church so that others will think highly of them, their family or their friends, right? Maybe it's to maintain a good reputation in the community. Maybe it's to feel better about themselves. You know what? There's some bad reasons to come to church. Yeah, that's right. I said it. There's some bad reasons to come to church. You might be thinking, well, at least I'm here. And I'm glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. But that's not what Jesus thought about pretenders. He said he would rather you be hot or cold, but definitely not this weird lukewarm stuff. In other words, Jesus was saying, you're either for me or you're against me, but do not pretend to love me when you really don't. So my word to you about this is don't be a Herod. Don't be a pretender. Don't use God and use church to get something or to fulfill some kind of insecurity in your heart. Worship Jesus for more of Jesus. Worship Him for Him. Not as a means to achieve your personal goals. Jesus said in John chapter 4, Verses 23 and 24, he said, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The third type of Worshipper, speaking of those who worship in spirit and truth, is believers. Mary and Joseph in this story. Joseph and Mary had every reason not to believe. First of all, the idea of a virgin conceiving a child was just as crazy sounding then as it is to you right now today. But Joseph believed the angel's word that this was a miracle for a special purpose. And what did he do? He obeyed immediately. Did you notice that? Like Joseph just obeyed. He obeyed because he believed the word of God. Secondly, moving to a foreign country, to Egypt, and leaving everything you've ever known behind. I mean, just imagine how incredibly hard that would be Not to mention that the reason you're doing it is because your child is being hunted. Your child is being hunted by an evil king who wants to kill him. I mean, could you imagine that scenario today? But Joseph and Mary believed the angel's words and obeyed. They believed and they obeyed. They trust, they obey. And after all that, they continue to obey God by moving to Nazareth. You see, wherever God called Mary and Joseph, they went. Without question. Wherever God wanted them to go, they went. Whatever storm in their life that came their way, Joseph and Mary had faith that produced obedience. Faith over over and over again that produced obedience. You could say it this way. Joseph and Mary's worship was authentic. It was real. Someone pretending, if Joseph was just pretending to get something else, if he was just using God to get something else, he would not have fled to Egypt. He would not have obeyed the angel's words. He would have divorced Mary. 
Someone who is just seeking and not really sure about their meaning and purpose in life as a child of God would not have lasted that long. I mean, like maybe for a little while, but they would have given up. It would have been too hard. But until we fully surrender our hearts and our lives to Jesus, the Savior King, we will not find rest for our souls. We will not be able to obey immediately. We will not have that faith that produces steady, steadfast obedience like Joseph and Mary had. We will not have that in our lives until we fully get rid of our agendas and our personal preferences and lay our lives before Jesus the Christ, the King. So what about you this morning? You're a worshiper because you're here. But I'm asking you, not just are you a worshiper, but what kind of worshiper are you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're seeking for truth. Jesus is the truth. And I want you to know that if you're seeking truth this morning, whatever mental roadblock you have that's keeping you from coming to Christ, I would love to talk with you more about that. Please, seriously, like just come up to me afterwards and we can talk about that. Let's talk about what the scriptures say. Let's talk about who Jesus really is. Let's do that. It's okay. We can just have a conversation. And maybe you're here this morning, though, and I don't want to be harsh because I want you to know there's grace for you, too, but maybe you're pretending. Maybe religion is something that you signed up for But it's not delivering what you thought it would because you're here really not for the right reason. Maybe you're pretending and maybe what you really need to do is just lay your pride and your selfishness and your agenda down and say, God, I have nothing. I have nothing to give. And that's exactly what he wants. He just wants you. And I want you to know that there is ultimate, never-ending overflowing grace and forgiveness for you. You can become a child of God today. And maybe you're here this morning and you are a believer. You do trust the Lord, but you don't see your life aligning like Mary and Joseph's, just that simple, steadfast obedience. I want you to know that the Lord loves you and His mercies are new every morning. So whatever you're struggling with right now, cast that care onto Jesus who has already died for it. And he'll give you the strength you need.